Good morning. Man, it's so good to see you guys today. And, and uh, Pastor Kevin's right. We are going to miss Carol around here, but we know that she is having a great time this morning, right? And we celebrate her and we celebrate that. I want to pray before we get started this morning. As we were worshiping, and man, wasn't that worship awesome? It was so good. But as I was standing there worshiping, all of a sudden I realized that the enemy was trying to clutter my mind up with stuff. Um, just to get me distracted. And maybe you felt that same way. So I want to pray this morning that God would just clear all the cobwebs out of your mind so that all of the seeds uh, from the word that need to be planted into you will take root. Can I do that? Lord, I thank you today, God, for the families here at Family Church and for those who are watching online right now. And, and I know, Lord, that... Um, the enemy is so sneaky and he is very good at what he does. And, and I know, Lord, that sometimes we carry things in here on Sunday morning that are heavy. It feels like baggage sometimes and we don't know uh, what to do with it. And so we just stew in it. And I know that what we stew in, we stay in. So this morning, I pray right now that you would clear our minds of all the clutter and Lord, that all of the, the seeds that go forward this morning, maybe a scripture, maybe something that's said, maybe a prayer uh, at the end, Lord, would connect directly with our hearts. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to believe that for you this morning as uh, we get into the teaching. I'm so glad you're here today. I know that it has been a crazy week, lots of things going on. I feel like uh, this week I've just been coming and going and, and had so much happening all around. And, and so this morning I want to just take a few minutes to slow down and say, okay, Lord, speak into my life so that I can speak into your life and we can leave here better than we came. Um, if you have your Bible this morning, you can turn with me to a couple of places. I'm going to be in James chapter 1, and then I'm going to be hanging out in Exodus chapter 20, and also in Exodus chapter 32. That will be where we will spend most of our time this morning. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, I'm in a series right now called Religion versus me Religion. How many of you are here last week? I know probably most of you. And we're talking about what happens when we make our relationship with God all about us. And I know that maybe you've never been guilty of that, but I certainly have. And I want to make those corrections in my life when I do get off course. How about you? I want to be able to get back on track and, and get things moving forward. And here's why. When my life, including my relationship with God, becomes all about me, I'm in trouble. Can you relate? I'm in trouble. When my life or my relationship with God becomes about me, I'm in trouble. As I said last week, studies have been done that have proven that self-centeredness is the greatest cause of unhappiness. And that's why we're attacking this. Life was never designed to be about us. Has anyone this morning ever heard of dog and cat theology? Okay. Okay. You haven't, so I get to enlighten you. Any, uh, any dog lovers out there? Any cat lovers out there? Oh, man, the dog lovers definitely outnumber the cat lovers today. Here's dog and cat theology. A dog realizes that its owner gives it food, shelter, and love, then thinks to itself, wow, my owner must be God. A cat realizes that its owner gives it food, shelter, and love, then thinks to itself, wow, I must be God. <laughs> and so around here at Family Church, we need to embrace dog theology. We need to understand that, that there's only one God and it's not us. And any time that I have ever made anything all about me, it always backfires and Jesus even talked about this many, many times. But one of the most famous things that Jesus said about this, he said, in order to find your life, you have to be willing to lose it. 
And that's really hard for a lot of people because we have a lot of time invested in our selfishness and in the things that maybe we haven't even prayed about or the things that we've just decided that we're going to do, even though we know that we don't have God's approval. And so we have to get this figured out. Now, um, full disclosure this morning. I'm, I'm not talking about ignoring um, your physical or emotional needs. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about not having boundaries. I, I'm not talking about um, rejecting self-care. I am, however, talking about self-love. Because if I love myself more than I love God, my life is going to go haywire. We don't need more self-love. We need more selfless love. Okay, and we're going to start today in James chapter one. We read this verse last week, but sometimes religion gets a bad rap and it can get a bad rap when it's all about rules and rituals and not really having a relationship with Jesus. But the Bible does talk about a religion that's good and it's found in James chapter one and verse 27. It says religion that God our father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And I, I love that that verse is in there. The kind of religion that pleases God, according to that verse, is about being holy and being helpful. And last week we learned how that religion that pleases God, it's about, it's about him and it's about them. It's never about us, right? Right? It's about him and it's about them. And that's exactly what James is talking about here in this verse. And you know what, guys? It's scary. It's scary. And I'm worried because, and I know I'm not supposed to be, but I am because we have a generation coming up that has been told for years, just do what makes you happy. And here's my advice to that generation. If what makes you happy makes God sad, prepare to be miserable. I'm going to say that again. If what makes you happy makes God sad, prepare to be miserable because you will be. And I want to walk you through that concept this morning. Today, here's where we're going. We're going to talk about Jesus versus Mises, okay? So what does worshiping Mises look like? Well, Mises is this, okay? We know who Jesus is, right? He's the son of God. You guys got that down? You know who he is, okay? Came to the earth, gave his life for our sins, okay? He's God's son, we get it, right? So what is Mises? Mises is worshiping a God that we create in our own image. Now, this is not a new concept. It's been happening since the beginning of time. It's us worshiping a God that we create in our own image. Mises is worshiping in a way that is all about me. It's worshiping a God who always agrees with us, a God who gives us a pass when our sins have a deep emotional connection because after all, he understands. It's worshiping a God who is okay with us never spiritually growing up. It's worshiping a God who never challenges the works of our flesh. And you know what, guys? My intention with this series is, is, not to, is not to beat you up. Writing these messages has been so painful for me because there are a lot of things in my life that are connected to my flesh that still aren't dead. And you know what? We're all in this together. And so that's why we have to figure it out because we're all in this together. And I'll go ahead and, and, and just put this out there when it comes to worshiping Mises instead of worshiping Jesus. Listen, I don't want a God. I don't want a sissy God. I want a God who challenges me and pushes me. I don't want a God that I can manipulate. And I don't want a God that I can change his mind. I don't want that kind of God. I want a God who has certain expectations of me, who puts his spirit inside of me, and then says, you know what, Larry? This is what I expect of you. 
That's the kind of God that I want to serve. I want a God who's really clear with me about what he expects from me. That's the kind of God that I want to serve. Okay, I don't want some sissy, wishy-washy God. And I say that because, because, listen, Jesus demands our loyalty. He does. It's, it's an all-in, no-turning-back lifestyle. When Jesus doesn't have our loyalty, the Bible speaks to that, and, and it's called idol worship, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Idol worship is, is unique to Christians, and you know why it's unique to Christians? Because we know who we're supposed to worship, don't we? I mean, if we don't know that, we failed, right? We know who we're supposed to worship. We know that Jesus is the one that demands our loyalty, the one that we're supposed to be going after all the time. And the very first commandment is all about who we worship. And it's really clear. It's in Exodus chapter 20. We're going to go there in just a moment. But in Exodus chapter 20, um, you know, the very first commandment, God, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. So he's talking about how that we have to put him first. And then Jesus came and he taught the same thing. He taught us to put first the kingdom of God and then everything else in life would work out. So the first commandment is all about who we worship. The second commandment, however, is all about how we worship, how we worship. I don't know about you, but I'm rarely confused about um, who I worship. I've never accidentally worshipped Buddha. Anybody here ever accidentally worshipped Buddha? I'll throw this in for good measure. I've never accidentally summoned a demon while doing yoga. <laughs> Unless you're praying to Satan while you're stretching and breathing, I think you're okay with yoga, okay? I'm going to get emails about that. I don't care. <laughs> I've never accidentally worshipped the devil. Anybody here ever accidentally done that? I know people who think you can accidentally take the mark of the beast. Listen, your debit card is not the mark of the beast. I'm sorry. <laughs> no one is going to accidentally take the mark of the beast. Listen, we, we know who we worship, but you know what we do mess up? The how. Right? We know who we worship. We know We know who we're supposed to be serving. We know who we're supposed to be following after. But it's the how that we mess up. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. Let's talk about the how. Um, he says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Now that's pretty good scripture. We're going to unwind that just a little bit this morning. Because there's so much content in that one verse. He's talking there about idol worship. So what is an idol? Well, an idol is, is anything or anyone who takes a position in our lives that is greater than God. And I like to think about idols as being nouns. So all of you English um, majors out there, what is a noun? It's a person, place, thing, or idea. Okay. So that's, that's a noun. So an idol is really a noun. It, it can be a person, a place, a thing, or an idea, um, that you are, that you are worshiping that, that is greater than God. Okay. Now I want to just establish that. Um, when we worship Mises instead of Jesus, we become that person who, who is greater than God. And I want to give you a little bit of history here. Remember um, the Ten Commandments, we just read those, or the first two of those, were, were first given to the children of Israel. And we know that they had just left Egypt, and, and as a result, they still had a lot of that culture that they picked up in Egypt ingrained into them because they had been there um, for several hundred years. In fact, most of the Egyptian artwork that is displayed in museums was once worshipped by that society 
as, as God. And um, when Pate and I um, were in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, we saw many of those idols that were worshipped during that time. And Tony, you were there. You were there too, right? Tony's here. And right after I met Tony, we spent a week together in the hotel. See, <laughs> that's how rumors get started, Tony. But we did, and it was awesome, and it was fun. But we were on a trip, a school trip, and and, and while we were there, literally in the Smithsonian, we saw things that were worshipped during that time frame in history. Things that were actually there during that time frame. They still exist and they're there. And so when, when God said, you shall not make an idol, the word make in the original Hebrew means to create. Okay, so he was saying, you shall not create your own God. In other words, don't conjure an image of me that comes out of your natural mind. Don't decide who I am based upon who or what you prefer. Okay, that's Mises. That's, that's you and your thought processes becoming God. Listen, guys, here's the test. Here's how you know if you're doing this, okay? Here's how you know if you've created a God in your own image. Number one is this. God always agrees with you. <laughs> does God always agree with you? Well, if he does, I would say you probably got a little bit of work to do in your life. Number one, God always agrees with you. Number two, you talk more about your truth and what that looks like than you do God's truth. And that's a big symptom here in our culture right now in America. Everybody talking about their truth rather than talking about God's truth. So once who we worship has been established, then we must establish how we worship. And the how is, is not on our own terms, okay? And it's easy to spot a person who wants to worship God on their own terms because they all have one thing in common. They want God's benefits, but they don't want his boundaries, they want his blessings, they want his goodness, they want his abundance, they, they want all the feels, they want all of that, but they don't want to be told how to live. They're like, yeah, sign me up for the blessing and the goodness and the abundance, and, and you know what? Sign me up for heaven because that sounds awesome, but don't tell me how to live, right? And it's been going on since the beginning of time. Give me all the good things, but don't talk to me about how to live. Guys, it's real simple. God is who he is, and if we are going to worship him, then we must worship him, who he is and not who we want him to be. Remember a few, a few weeks ago in the message about um, pruning your life of negative relationships when I said you can only be in a relationship with someone as they are, not as you wish they were. You guys remember that? Well, guess what? That also apply, imply, applies to God. You can only be in a relationship with God as he is, not as you wish that, that he was. And so the question is this, is God supposed to bend in order to fit our expectation of him? Or are we supposed to bend to fit his expectation of us? How is it supposed to work? Well, it depends on if you're worshiping Jesus or Mises, right? It depends on that. And I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of an, an illustration here. Parents, you parents that are out there, do you bend to fit the expectation of your child? <laughs> do you? Because if you do, you know what's going to happen, right? And God is like that. God is, God is not going to bend to, to fit your expectation of him. He can't. It's not in his nature to do that. So, so here's the thing, guys. Take a look at your life, okay? Take a look at your life. And I want, I want you to ask yourself, do I accept God as he is, or do I try to create a God that is a little more user-friendly? If you're like me, I'm not very computer literate, I guess. That's a good way to say it. I can email. That's about as far as it goes. And 
I don't really know how to do much anything else other than write. I ha- you know, I can write, but I don't really do anything else. And so I'm always looking for the most user-friendly things, you know, whenever I'm working on my computer. And that's what we sometimes try to do with God. Another question is this that you need to ask yourself. Have I decided that the God of the Bible is too old-fashioned? Have I decided that the God of the Bible is too old-fashioned? Here's another one you need to ask yourself. Have I told myself that times are changing and that God changes with the times? And just be honest about where you are in that loop. Because these are all valuable questions that we should be asking ourselves all the time. And, and, and here's, here's a great way that you can tell um, if you've fallen into that trap. Maybe you have an area of your life that, that you know is wrong or maybe uh, something connected to your life that you know is wrong according to scripture, but you feel like that you have actually worked out a deal with God. And so by doing that, you, you, you know, you treat God like he's this mob boss that's out there. And, and you, you say, I know you don't like this, but you know what, God, let's like, let's work out a deal here, God. You know what? It never works. It never, ever works. A lot of people are attracted to the God of love, but they, re- they, they reject the rest of God's personality. It's like they are saying, I like the love part, but, but the judgment part really doesn't fit my image of who he is. And so I'm just going to kind of dismiss that part. But all the love stuff, pour that on, Right? But see, God, God is both a lion and a lamb. He is a God of love, but he, he is, he's also a God of justice. And God always demands that whenever we violate his word, that, that there, there is a balancing of the scales. And that's the part that we sometimes don't like. Now, one of the, one of the phrases that God used to describe himself to Moses was... Um, I am. And that's, that's a little bit hard to understand. Moses said, who do I tell them is sending me whenever he was going to free the children of Israel? And God said, you tell them that I am is sending you. The word I am in the Hebrew means this. It means I am who I am. I have always been who I am. And I will always be who I am. So basically God was saying, I am a consistent God and I don't change. And so when you go, you tell them consistency is sending you, right? Consistency is sending you. The God who I've always been, I'm still that God, and I'm not changing my mind about who I am. I know who I am, and that's, that's the way that it's going to be for eternity, right? And so we, we got to get this. Now, not even God can change who he is. And if God can't change who he is, then I'm pretty sure you have not been assigned to change who he is. Okay? And neither have I. So let's, let's move on to the second part. So sin usually involves an idol. And let's go back to what happened right after the commandments were given. And this is my favorite part of this message. And I want to take just about, you know, a couple hours here with it. Um, um, so keep in mind that proper worship, guys, listen, you know, you're, you're sitting out there, maybe you're skeptical and it's okay. It's okay for you to be where you are. And, um, it's like I told someone yesterday, I'm your friend either way. Okay. If you agree with me, if you don't agree with me, that's okay. Like I'm still your friend. So maybe you're sitting out there and you're a little bit skeptical because you, you know, you have this belief system of who you've decided God is. Um, and if, if, if that's you, I just want you to hear me out this morning. I want you to keep in mind that proper worship isn't for God's benefit. It's for ours because he knows how life works, right? It's not for his benefit. It's for ours. Um, it, Proper worship is, is our natural habitat. It's, it's where we thrive. And so if you're not thriving, check the habitat. You would never put a fish in an aquarium with a heat light full of sand. 
Okay, some of you would. I can clearly see that right now. <laughs> you would never, you know, put your, your hamster in an aquarium full of water and just be like, there you go, little buddy. I hope you have a good life. I hope you can swim. You would never do that. You, you would make sure, if you're a good pet owner, you would make sure that the habitat matched the pet. Because if the habitat doesn't match the pet, then there's no way for the pet to thrive. Proper worship is your natural habitat. And so in my life, when I'm not thriving, you know what I do? First thing, I don't blame anybody else, and I don't blame God for sure. But in my life, when I'm not thriving, you know what I do? First thing, I check the habitat. I check the habitat. I check my, my, my environment, how I'm living. That's, the fir- that's my first go-to thing is I always check the habitat first. So in Exodus chapter 20, God uses his, his finger to write the commandments on, on stone tablets. And you know what? Can we not just stop overlooking the awesomeness of that? Isn't that awesome? I mean, come on. God takes his finger and he writes 10 commandments on tablets of stone. Isn't that pretty darn amazing? Oh, you guys are hard to impress. <laughs> I know. That's why I work so hard on these messages. You guys are like, eh, guy, yeah, he's horrible. You know, we just keep coming, but he's horrible. Listen, it, it's pretty darn amazing when you think about it. And so after that, here, here's the thing. So God writes 10 commandments, okay? And after that, the tabernacle gets built, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with that that we don't have time to talk about, but the tabernacle gets built right after the Ten Commandments come, and the glory of God first appears. Now, that's an amazing thing if you start reading about the glory of God and, and what all that entails. So, so the, tab, the, the commandments come, the tabernacle gets built, and after the tabernacle gets built, they put the furniture in there. So we have things like the Ark of the Covenant, um, we have the table of showbread, we have the golden lampstands, and they're all placed inside the tabernacle. After the tabernacle gets built, the priesthood is appointed. Aaron and his sons become the high priest. And then after Aaron and his sons are appointed, the anointing oil gets made. And one of the first messages I ever taught here uh, before I was the pastor was about those ingredients that were in that anointing oil. Anyone remember that sermon? Okay, clearly I made an impression on all of you, okay? So, so, so the, the, the commandments are, are, are given, the tabernacle gets built, the Ark of the Covenant is there, the priesthood is appointed, the anointing oil gets made. Come on, you know what you and I would call this? Revival. Can you think about that for a minute? You've been in slavery for 400 years. All you've known is slavery. And all of a sudden, not only are you free, but you're experiencing the glory of God. And you have, you have a priesthood. And you have the anointing oil. And you have all these things. And you know what? From that point forward, we should expect the people of God to be thriving in their relationship with him. Shouldn't we? I mean, come on. This is everything they ever wanted. And there it is. They're walking in it. They're living in it. They're out of slavery and God is meeting with them. And on a side note, I will add this. The point I just made tells me that good church services never, never carry more weight in your life than your personal relationship with God. And so don't blame the church when you're going off the rails like a crazy train. They had all the things. They had all the things. They had all the things that we want. And if you go to Exodus chapter 32, in my mind, I'm thinking we should be reading about a great revival. Week six of this series is called Me-Vival. I'm super excited about that one and I can't wait to teach it. But this should be revival. All these things happen between Exodus chapter 20, God giving the commandments, all the things I just talked to you about, the tabernacle, the anointing oil, the priesthood, all the things, all these things happened, and then we get to Exodus chapter 32. Now, how many of you think they should be in revival? 
We should be reading about great revival. Okay, here's what happens. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. What? Like I thought we were having revival. As for this fellow Moses, isn't that a little bit insulting? God sent the dude to deliver them out. And he brought these plagues and all these things and they saw the power of God and they're like, as for this, you know, man, people are fickle, right? Sometimes they forget about all the good things that you've done for them. And so they're like, as for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't even know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Now, fashioning it with a tool. Can we all agree that this was an intentional act, making this calf? Because what did he do? He had to pour it into a mold, right? And then after it came out, he took a tool and he started, you know, doing some detail work on it. Um, Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Now remember, they weren't doing this to the Lord. They were doing this to this, to this calf. And afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in rev- revelry. Okay, now, revelry is a hard word to say, but basically, it was a drunken orgy. Okay, that's what, that's what they did. Whew! Man, revival is here. (laughs) As for Pastor Larry, we don't even know where this guy, he's probably fishing at the lake. We don't even know where he's at. And so let's figure out another path forward. Let's figure out something else that we can do. It's so crazy because they had seen God send these 10 plagues to get them out of, G- out of Egypt. They had seen God part the Red Sea at this point. They had seen God um, provide the manna and the water out of the rock and all the things. And I, I encourage you to go back and read that today. And now they are calling the calf Lord. <laughs> Why? They wanted a God that was more in line with what they wanted to do. Then they wanted a God that was in line with the permanent truth of scripture. So read read the rest of the story today because we clearly read where Aaron fashioned the gold into a calf. But here's the great thing. When um, in verse 24, when when Moses confronted him, it's so so good. Um, Aaron tells Moses this crazy story and he says, he says, well, boss, um, I just took all this gold and put it in the fire and this calf jumped out. (laughs) Can you imagine? That's what he said. He said, I just put it in the fire. The, The man clearly poured it into a mold, right? The man clearly took a tool and chiseled it down. And he said, um... I just put it in the fire and this, this calf jumped out. Listen, sometimes we get like that. We have no problem with having a God. We just want him to fit our perspective rather than changing our perspective to fit him. And I think, I think this is really interesting and I'm gonna take about 10 minutes here and then we're gonna pray. I think it's so interesting that they made a calf to worship. Why is that interesting? Because, because, You don't serve a calf, a calf serves you. 
A calf serves you with what? It serves you with milk. It serves you with meat. A calf's very existence is to meet your needs on your terms. Even the skin of a calf is there to keep you warm. The calf is about you. Calf worship is worshiping you. Not only that, but a calf makes no requirements. All it needs is a field, and it will take care of itself. What I mean by that is your lifestyle does not bother a calf. A calf could care less what you do. A lot of people want a lifestyle that isn't bothered by God. They want a God that doesn't notice their behavior, a God that is preoccupied with with picking at the grass. My dad has a lot of cattle, and I have never been out at the farm one time and had a calf question my lifestyle, my choices, or my spiritual condition. And if that ever happened, I'm probably going to have a heart attack and die, but (laughs) come on, some of you guys that have cattle, have you ever been out in the field and just had a calf stroll up and say, hey, how's your thought life? <laughs> Never one time have I had a calf ask me anything about myself. But I have, you know, eaten a lot of beef. From there, I wore my leather jacket to church this morning, all from a calf. The calf is about me. They wanted a God that was all about them. That's what they made. Finally, a calf can be pinned up and kept out of certain areas. Wouldn't it be great if you had a God that you could put a fence around so that he wouldn't be aware of what you were doing in certain areas of your life? Yeah, it makes you nervous, doesn't it? (laughs) A calf was a God that they could control because a calf can be pinned up. So in conclusion, having no idols is really about approaching God correctly and not culturally. We're going to talk a bunch more about that next week. It's, it's seeing God not as a calf, but as a king who has the right to command us. Not because he is cruel, but because he is kind and gently directing us down a good path. Listen, we don't need a calf. We need a shepherd. And in this story, God gets so mad at the people. God, it's one of those times where God actually changes his mind because God's just like, you know what, Moses? I'm going to kill all of them and start over with you. And I would have been like, cool, let's do it. But that's not what Moses said. Moses was like, Lord, remember, these people came from dirt. And you have to remember that. They're all just a bunch of dirt bags. (laughs) They came from dirt. And that's just what people who come from dirt do. And so, Lord, please be merciful with these people. And God was like, okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to kill them this time. And so Moses was like, I know, we'll just... You know, we'll, take, we'll melt down the gold, mix it with water, and make them all drink it, you know. So that was what they did. But the calf was about them. We were never designed to serve a calf god. All right, we're going to stop right there. Let's all stand. Oh, Lord, I'm so grateful today that you understand my natural habitat. I'm so thankful today that you know where I thrive And you know where that sweet spot of life is. And so many times when people aren't thriving or people are in a lifestyle that is not conducive to your blessing, they're quick to blame everybody and everything around them. They blame society. They blame how they were raised. They blame the church. They, they blame the, the neighbors, okay? They blame everybody. But, Lord, the truth of the matter is, like, 
when we're not thriving, we have to check our habitat. We have to stop pointing the finger at everybody else around us and just say, hey, I want to look at my life and I want to see what my life looks like in comparison to the God of the Bible. Not the God that I've conjured in my mind, not the God that other people may have told me he is, but what does the Bible actually say about this God, this, this God who is not a calf, but a king? A God who, who says, life, Larry, life is not about you, it's about me. And when you live it for me, um, then you're really gonna find the life that I, that I always had in mind for you. But Lord, if I continue to try to hang on to the life that I conjure and create, then I'm never going to have the life that you have already predecided is mine. So I just thank you today, Lord, that I can trust you with all of it and that I, I can put my hope in you alone you're not a, a calf God who can easily be pinned. You're not a calf God that, that, is, that is there to, to serve me. No, 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 no. No, you are, you are a ruling shepherd that deserves my allegiance and my loyalty. And you have it. And I'm just so thankful for that today. And I, I pray, Lord, that as we conclude this service this morning, that we're thinking about this message, we're thinking through the process, not, not of who we worship, but of how we worship, okay? How we worship, who, who is, is Jesus, we get that. <clears throat> how sometimes becomes about us. And we have to break that off and break that loose this morning so that we can move forward in freedom. And we just thank you for that today right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want the prayer team to come back this morning and I'm gonna do just a couple of things. We're gonna sing one last song together today, but I want you to think about your life just for a moment. And if you're here and maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, maybe you've never uh, invited him into your heart. Um, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and Guys, that's the first step, okay? Uh, sometimes we take it for granted, you know, that everyone has just done that. Um, but the very first commandment was, was, was so, so clear. No other gods before me. Like, I am the number one. I am the number one in your life. And if Jesus is not the number one God in your life, then, then you haven't yet truly met him as savior. And you need to do that this morning before you leave here, okay? And every single person that is standing here at this front is well equipped to help you do that. If you're here today and you've been struggling with maybe not who you worship, but how you worship. Maybe uh, there's just some things in your life that have become more about you. Um, remember what an idol is. It's a person, a place, a thing, or it can be an idea. And when anything um, that's a noun uh, begins to take precedent in your life um, over your relationship with the Lord, then that's an idol. And you have to deal with that this morning. You have to come before the Lord and just say, hey, Lord, I'm sorry. And I, I see that and I need to do better in this area. And you know what? You don't have to feel guilty or bad when you leave here because he'll help you and you just go on living your life, right? And it'll be good. So we're gonna sing this last song together this morning. And if you, if any of that fits you, or maybe you just need some prayer because you're going through some physical things or you need a new job, or maybe you're just in a season of frustration or depression, we would love to pray for you as well. Um, so guys, go ahead and come back and we're gonna sing this together. And if you need any of that, you need Jesus, you need to reevaluate your relationship with Jesus. You just need some prayer because you're struggling however you fit into any of that this morning. We would open these altars and we would invite you to come. And if not, just spend some time worshiping today before we get home.